your sermon by Michael Bruce. And uh, the text of the sermon is Mark chapter 9, starting in verse 43. Mark chapter 9, starting in verse 43. And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thy eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. There are two things that may be registered by Christians in our day, and I would have all of you to register them. The first is that there is much in religion, and there are many mysteries in godliness, and I think you should never dispense with your ignorance of these. But because they are mysteries, we lay them aside, never to be practiced by us. We told you in the forenoon of six mysteries that religion hath in its bosom. We shall now proceed and give you another two. But I think for the most part we are strangers unto them all. One mystery is this, that the Christian, while he is in the world, should be always living upon things not seen. Oh, say the men of the world, if we could see heaven with our bodily eyes, we would think something of it. But since we cannot take it up with our bodily eyes, we think a bird in our hand worth two flying. We think the goods and gear we have in this world, as being now in our hand, must be better than heaven that we cannot now see. Yet faith makes the Christian live upon things not seen. For we look not on things which are seen, which are temporal. That is a strange look, to look through all things unto heaven and to get a sight of the glory that is there. Faith will get a sight of heaven and look as far as the glory that is there. Another mystery couched in the bosom of religion is when sense says he comes and reason says he will not come. The Christian by religion says he will come and will not tarry. That is a strange mystery, sirs. Know ye anything of it? Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Sense and reason say he tarries, but faith says he will come and will not tarry. The men of the world say the Lord will not come to Scotland again, but they are fools. For when he comes, he will be the worst sight that some of them ever saw. The second thing we are to register in our bosom in this our day is that wherever there is religion indeed, it hath still much hard work going along with it. For one to cut off the hand is a hard work. Religion may put the people of God upon duties with these three things attending them. Therefore, do not think to live idle if you would live religious. Take notice and observe. First, the leaving of houses or lands, wife and children, and all other relations may attend religion. They must have thy seeming good fortune in the world and take Christ and his cross for all. That must be a very hard and difficult duty that puts folk upon quitting all. The disciples of Christ did so. Up stands Peter and says, We have forsaken all and followed thee. Peter had goods and gear, friends and relations too, doubtless, but he says, We have left all and followed thee. And ye will tell me, Have any of you left all and followed Christ? It is true, it was but of little value that the disciples had when all is done for we read only of some boats and a few nets 
they had got their living with and these seemed to be old for they were, they were mending them when Christ called them. However, they left all and followed him. Secondly, religion or perseverance in duty may put folk to much sensible loss with little sensible advantage attending it for the present. Is it not a sensible loss to cut off a hand or a foot or put out an eye? All the world that see me do this know that I am a sensible loser and I have no promise of present advantage by it. But Christ sends me to heaven and to hell to seek, so to speak, advantage. All the advantage I am to have by the, by the game, I am to gather of the considerations of heaven and hell. Now that is a very difficult duty that puts me to sensible loss while I have no upmaking at present, but must travel a long journey as far as heaven ere I get my upmaking or advantage. But faith hath still this noble property. It will make a long time seem short. For what is the matter, man, for all thy losses? A few years will make thee as if thou hadst no losses. In a few years thou must die and leave all. Be as it will. And it is a sore matter that though thou hast no lease of thy goods and gear, and though thou wilt lose all in a few years at any rate, yet thou wilt keep them now when Christ calls thee to forsake them. Yet thou wilt keep them to bring the curse of God upon thyself and wilt not rather forsake them now for Christ who through his purchase would bring thee to heaven and glory and will not bring Christ to be thy debtor, so to speak, for the interest until thou go thither. Some few years may make thee lose it, whether thou wilt or not, and maybe thou mayst lose it before thou die, and not for so good a cause. Job had more thousands to boast of in one day than any of you has to boast of in twenty. And ere twenty-four hours came about, he had nothing. Naked, says he, came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. What is the matter, would he say? Though I go three years naked in the world, if my master call me to do it. I came naked into the world, and let me go naked out of it. A little time will put an end to all my toil. Now, sirs, death will make you part with it. In a little, be as it will. And may ye not credit your master with two or three years interest, or so much per cent, for thou shalt have no want. If it be for thy good, thou shalt have thy dinner, thy supper, and wonder wrapped about the head of it. O oh, gallant, we will get our breakfast and our supper, and wonders wrapped about the head of them. We got them long since as the fruit of our own handiwork. But now we get them as wonders. I got my food long since, but now it hath a wonder wrapped about the head of it. The folk recorded in Matthew 2, 15 to 21 got their dinner with a wonder wrapped about the head of it. Third, a difficult duty that religion may put folk upon is this. It may put you upon a duty that may go betwixt you and your chiefest enjoyments in a world. The loss of thy choicest enjoyments attend that duty that religion puts thee upon following. And is not that a difficult thing? Well, could the devil say, skin for skin, all that a man hath will he give for his life. Religion may bring the loss of lives with it. Religion has become a very difficult work nowadays when folk must lose their lives for it. Therefore, you must carry the faith of this along with you, that by losing your life, you shall save it. Now, religion will tell man what nature cannot tell him. Religion will tell a man what the boasters of the country will never tell him. The word of the Lord tells me that by losing, I shall gain. Therefore, says Paul, I am willing to be offered up a sacrifice. But fourth, religion 
may put folk upon very painful duties. It is a very painful duty to cut off a hand, a foot, and to pluck out an eye. Religion will make you sweat ere ye be done with it. I think some folk have sweat more in going to hell than ever some of you have done in going to heaven. Will you do as much to gain heaven as some folk do to gain hell? Will you do as much to gain heaven as some folk do to get food and raiment? Some folk will work and work to be rich and yet will never be rich. Will ye labor as much for heaven as some folk do for riches? But again, fifth religion will call you to such duties as will offer violence to yourselves, which is a thing that nature cannot digest. See two pieces of violence that a man in duty offers. First, a piece of violence is this. He offers violence to heaven. The kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. Therefore, he lays the ladder to heaven's walls, as it were, and takes it by violence. But I think there are not many of you at that violent work. And then second, the man offers violence to himself. He plucks out the eye and he cuts off the hand and the foot of himself. But I think ye be all become now great pitiers of yourselves. Well then, for use of this, lay your account with difficult duties. Lay your account with very painful duties. Lay your account with offering violence to yourselves. These are the things you must resolve on if you have a mind for heaven. The observation we left off at in the forenoon was this, that the Christian may have right-hand idols that offend him in his walk towards heaven. We told you what this imports, what, their, what were quali- qualifications of these idols, and what way these right-hand idols offend the Christian in his Christian course. The next thing proposed and to be spoken to is wherein the sadness of this lies to have right-hand idols offending folk. Now, the sadness of it lies in these three things. First, as long as thy right hand is offending thee, thou art like a kingdom against itself. For when we work all one way, it is heartsome, but when, we, when one piece of us works against another, oh, that is sad. When the hand offends thee, it is very sad upon that account because it is like a kingdom divided against itself. But second, the sadness of it lies in this, that then the devil never lacks an agent to plead his cause in our bosom. For my part, I think it a very sore matter that it should be so. Oh, the agents the devil has against us Ere he wants agents for himself, he will make the wife an agent against her husband, or the husband against the wife, and one Christian against another. Oh, think ye, but that it is a sad matter, that one of you should plead the devil's cause against another? Yea, ere he want an agent, he will take the hand, the foot, or the eye of a Christian to plead his cause against the Christian. Oh, but it would, be, it would break a hundred hearts to see how many agents the devil will get in a Christian's bosom. And third, the sadness of it lies in this, that it mars the poor man's progress toward heaven and furthers his progress towards hell. And think ye not that a very sad matter? O oh, Christians, is heaven no more worth to you than a little pleasure? Now, for use of this, know, sirs, that there are right-hand idols amongst you. Then, oh, beware of them. But another use that I intend now to insist upon is this, that it is the choice duty and the great thing that God calls for at the Christian's hand, that whatever offends him in his Christian course, though it were his right hand, foot, or eye, yet, says Christ, cut it off. And cast it from thee. Cut off right hand idols and never let them come near thee again. Now, in treating of these, I will show 
under the first heading what this cutting off is that a Christian must study in order to be to cut off right hand idols. The second heading wherein lies the commendableness of this to be cutting them off. Third heading a word of caution in answer to some objections. And fourth heading a word of use and to go forward. First heading First thing to be spoken to is what is this cutting off that a Christian must study in order to cut off right-hand idols? This imports three things. First, that there must be no quarter granted to your idols. You must cut off all treaties and parleys. Treat none, parley none. Cut off all these, for they will seek a parley with thee. They will give down something. If thou wilt come one bit of ground, they will come another. The men of the world will plead for a parley, and they will give down something. If thou wilt come some length and meet them, but ye must now compound none. Say, I will hear none but to the door with them. Cutting off is the work I will be at with them. And second, this imports that a Christian should be well acquainted with the sword whereby they are to be cut off. Many would have idols and lusts cut off, but they know not the sword whereby they are to be cut off. There is a sword and the back on it. If you know not that, you will never cut off right-hand idols and lusts. This sword is the word of God and the back of it is the spirit of God. Now you must take both the sword and the back of it. For though you take the sword, if you want the back of it, it will be blunt. It may well ruffle the side of lusts, but it will never draw their blood. And though it draw their blood, it will not take away their life without the back. Know ye the sword, and know ye the back of that ye must have. If ye cut off lusts and idols that are near and dear unto you, ye must have both the sword and the back of that sword to cut them off. And third, it imports that there must be a piece of cruelty used by the Christian against himself if ever he get rid of them. I think there is a senseless sort of pitifulness among some folk that they cannot take the life of corruption. They do not cut off idols. I but the devil and they will make no bones of it to take their life. Wherefore art thou so sparing of them, since they are so cruel to thee? This imports that there must be a piece of cruelty used by the Christian, even to himself, if he would be rid of right-hand idols in the day of the cross. But this cutting is such as has these five things going along with it. First, it is cutting off all parleying with lusts and idols. The Christian is still sure to lose by parleying. Therefore, cut off all parleying. There is no parleying in heaven with lusts and idols. And second, thou must cut off all meat and drink from thy idols. Make no provision for the flesh. Provide nothing for thy lusts. For still the more thou feedest them, thou wilt be the worse used by them. Make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. But it is a poor trade some of you drive when you bring meat and drink to your lusts on a Sabbath morning. No wonder God makes some of you go empty to your beds at night. Because you fed your lusts all the day long. Third, you must cut off all foster fathers that cherish the sprouting and springing of lusts. They must be cut off. Fourth, you must cut off the right hand less timorously when it first begins to break out and set up its head, thou must bring the sword, which is the word of God, and the back of that sword, which is the spirit of God, and drive its head in pieces. But ye are so little in observing these lusts that ye let them come to a dreadful length ere ye ever draw the sword amongst them. Fifth, thou must have much revenge and indignation at sin, Attending thy cutting off of idols, thou must cut them off with revenge and indignation of spirit. Thou must not cut them off with indulgence, but thou must cut them off with detestation and cast them away. I know not, sirs, 
I think some folk make a deal of noise about cutting off right-hand idols, as it were, in the morning, but in the evening are at peace with them again. Many are cutting off right-hand idols in the morning and casting them away, and in the evening are writing letters for them again. It will never be well with the Christian till he cut them off with the spirit of revenge and indignation. Now, there is a fourth way of cutting off right-hand idols, and it is this. Thou must cast them off constantly. The sword must never go out of thy hand. For there are many of them, and they are all to be cut off. It cannot be told how many cuts a right-hand idol that is born and bred with thee will take before it is cut off. Therefore, it must be a constant work. And fifth, you must cut off with gladness heartily and cheerfully. So hearty and cheerful must thou be in it that thou never wentest about an action more cheerfully and heartily in all thy life. But I think it is a backward and drooping-like work that some of you to cut off right-hand idols so that the devil may read the copy of it in your countenances. Though ye be parting with them at one time, yet ye give them quarters at another time. It may be ere many days go about, the devil and his lusts may get leave to come in again to their old place. But six, it is a cutting off wherein the Christian makes use of three pieces of spiritual wisdom. He cutteth off the root as well as the branches. Let the branches bring thee to the root. And let the root bring thee to the branches, and so cut off all. Still, let the streams bring thee to the fountain. It will never be well with the Christian till the roots of idols be plucked up in the day of trouble. Second, make use of this piece of wisdom. Get a stronger hand than thine own to help thee cut them off. It will not be thy work nor industry, neither will be thy grace gifts nor parts that will cut off right-hand idols. No, nothing less than the Spirit of God, nothing less than the strength of Christ will make thee cut off right-hand idols. Therefore, get the Spirit of God and the strength of Christ still in the bargain and work will prosper better on thy hand. Third, let this piece of wisdom be in cutting off thy right-hand idols Whenever thou hast cut them off, set a watch over the place where thou hast cut them off. Whenever thou hast cut off a right-hand idol and buried it, set a watch upon the mouth of the grave. And so whenever it sets up its head, the watchman may give an alarm. The old enemy is up again. It is a sore matter that some Christians have the same ado this year. As to the cutting off right-hand idols, that they had several years since. Will not that become a heartbreak, that they have the same snares, the same lusts and temptations to fight against that they had several years since? It must be their bad guiding that hath made it so. Or if thou hadst set a watch upon the grave of thy idols when thou overcamest them, thou hast not been so much troubled with them as thou now art. Another thing requisite in cutting off right-hand idols is thou must cut them off so that as you and they may never dwell together in one house again, nor in one man's land. You must cut them off that you and they shall never dwell under one roof again. The second heading, the next thing to be spoken to is wherein the commendableness lies of cutting off right-hand idols in the day of trouble. And the commendableness of it lies in these three things. First, thou wilt hereby, thereby be saved from many offenses at Christ and his way that others will be guilty of. Thou sayest that Christ lurks much in thy bosom, and it says that heaven is pleasant to thee. It is so pleasant that it makes thee cut off a hand, a foot, and pluck out an eye ere thou want it whatever hindrance that may be in the way, that would make Christ seem unpleasant and unlovely. Yes, yet says the Christian that hath right-hand idols cut off, I will quit all before I quit him. 
But I know well that Christ is not so delightsome to some of you that before ye quit right-hand idols, ye will lay your life at stake. But secondly, the commendableness of this exercise lies in this, that it says, Thou art obedient to thy king's command. And I never heard of a Christian losing by his obedience. But I have heard of many losing by their disobedience. Therefore, be cutting off right-hand idols if you would be obedient to your king and head, your lord and master. Thirdly, the commendableness of it lies in this, that it says that grace is uppermost in thy bosom. As long as grace carries the day in a Christian's bosom, his master will not be ill-pleased with him. He may well try thee. He will not be angry with thee. He may well put thee upon the touchstone to make it known to the world and to thyself what stuff thou art of, but he will do no more evil to thee. Now, with regard to cutting off these, do not mistake for a right-hand idol the throat of which a Christian may have cut this year. May the next year be alive again. Now, there are three reasons why it may be so. First, your negligence in not setting a watch upon the grave of that idol. Now, because of thy negligence, it hath gotten up its head again. It hath a powder plot under the ground and so hath laid thee upon thy back again. The second, God in his justice hath been provoked to do so. What way doth God in his justice ordinarily take with sleepy professor? Even thus he permits his old lusts and sins to come back upon the poor man, lusts that he thought were dead and buried, lusts that drag the poor creature at their heels again, because he was not vigilant to watch against such sins and mourned no more for them. And third, it may be an old lust or idol that thou thoughtest was now dead and buried has come back again to thee upon this account because thou hast been the person that had trusted more to thyself than to Christ. And as long as thou trustest to thyself, no wonder that the old idols come back again and lay thee upon the breadth of thy back. Third heading, But do not mistake this, that many times the Christian may go about the exercise of cutting off right-hand idols, but may be sadly vexed with these five objections. And all these objections are the rife in Scotland these days that hinder poor folk from cutting off right-hand idols. The first objection against cutting off right-hand idols is nature. Nature says, no, I will lose none of my members. Oh, monster, says the idol, wilt thou destroy nature? To cut off thy right hand, that is a thing I cannot think to do. Nature says, no, I cannot cut them off. But God says, ye must cut them off. Now, whether is God or nature to be obeyed? Think ye not that it is better to obey God than nature? And therefore, though nature say no, yet thou must either cut them off or disobey God. And so thou shalt have a poor life of it. A second objection against cutting off right-hand idols is necessity. Necessity says, I must not do it. For how shall I work if I want my hand? If I want my eye, how shall I be useful to the poor people of God? I will then be fit for nothing. Necessity says, I cannot want my goods and gear, my house and my land. I cannot meddle with the contradictions of necessity. Necessity has no law, says the poor man. But wilt thou consider thy necessity? Keep thy goods and gear, thy pleasures and enjoyments. Yet God says, cut them off. And whether is God or thy carnal necessity to be obeyed, thou sayest thou wilt not be useful to other Christians if thou want thy goods, etc. I say, thou wilt be more useful by setting them a good example than that thou shouldest spend all that thou hast upon them. Give them a copy and an example, for by quitting your goods and gear at God's call, you may be useful through the blessing of God to make many give obedience to Christ's call and to lie down at Christ's feet, and that will be better than if thou hadst given all thou hadst to the poor and distressed. 
There is a third objection against cutting off right-hand idols, and that is reason. Reason says, no, watch against it. Am not I a rational man? I never saw or heard of such irrational folk. They say that for a work of reformation, they will lose all that they have, and think ye that a rational deed? I am called to act rationally, say the men of the world. And that were an irrational act to leave my wife and my children. But wilt thou tell me, wise man, where thou learnest that wisdom? I will not give a four-penny piece for thy owning the covenant. For you will say one thing for it this year, and another thing contrary to it the next. But for my part, I think no wonder that those who are not true to God will never be true to a covenant of man either. But our master commands you to cut off, and that hath equality and reason in the bosom of it. But I will not say that the reason that his commands have in their bosom will be will suit with thy carnal reason. Nor will I say that thy carnal reason will suit with a divine rule and divine equality that hath a right and sanctified reason in the bosom of it. Well, there may be a divine command lying at thy door, and yet thou be so blind that thou canst see little reason for obeying it. Yet the command has an answerable reason in the bosom of it. Well, the power of an infinite God must prevail and have weight with thy heart to persuade thee to do it for that hath reason in its bosom though thou at present see no reason for it. There is a fourth objection against cutting off right-hand idols and that is thou thinkest it a foul shame to do it. All the countryside will call thee a fool to cut off thy right hand They will swear and say, Thou murderest both thyself and thy family. Thou hast made thyself one-handed, they will say. And that is thy shame and ruin of of thy family. Wilt thou tell me, wise man? Wilt thou call that thy shame, which is thy duty? Thou savorest of the things that be natural and carnal of flesh and blood, but thou savorest not the things that be of God and of the Spirit of God. But I would, carnal wretch, put these two things to thee. First, whether it is most shame to go to heaven or to hell. Christ says it is better to go to heaven with one hand than to go to hell with two hands and shame and the curse of God with thee. For such shame shalt thou have and much shame shall come upon thee. And second, whatever supposed shame is in obedience to the command, yet there is no real shame in it. Therefore, whether wilt thou be best content to carry a real shame or or an imputed shame? For whatever imputed or supposed shame may attend the obeying of God's commands, yet it hath no real shame attending it. For as sure as God is in the heavens above, the man that ventures most for God now shall be the least ashamed man in Scotland, say the contrary, who will will. These these wise folk who dare venture nothing for Christ, nor his cause, shall take the side of the street, when that man shall take the crown of it. It is more shame to be going to heaven. Is it more shame to be going to heaven with one hand than having two to be going to hell? Remember I said it, that there is no shame in heaven, Neither ministers nor professors will bear any shame there, though they have cut off right-hand idols for Christ. It is no shame for me to be obeying my master's command. My credit lies in this, to be cutting off right-hand idols at his command. There is a fifth objection against cutting off right-hand idols for Christ. That is, you think it is an act of cruelty. And Christianity bids us rather be compassionate. Shalt thou be cruel to thyself? It is an act of cruelty to cut off the very right hand of himself. He hath but two hands to get his bread with, and if he shall cut off one of them, how shall he fare then? He hath but two feet to go through the world, and if he must cut off one of them, how must he go then? 
I know well, says the wise man of the world, religion never allowed any man to be cruel to himself. But I know well, religion never allowed a man to pity himself, but consistently with that pity that he is to show to his soul. Art thou not cruel to thyself, says the wise man? Thou hast but a poor, weakly body that cannot take with other folks' beds and cannot take with every sort of diet. And yet thou wilt cast thyself into extremity and trouble in following bits of preaching up and down the country. And many a wet foot and cold bath thou wilt get. And that will be the very means of thy death. Art not thou cruel then to thyself? For thou mightest well be in thine own chamber and have thine own bed, diet, fireside, and that were far better for thee. Now, thou mayest die in some moss or in a wilderness or at some dike side, and never one that pertains to thee see thee then. Or thou mayest die among strangers, and never one of my relations get notice of thee. And art not thou cruel to thyself then? It matters not, says the poor man. I must have the milk. I would be more cruel if I should let my soul famish for want of the milk. Whether or no, think ye our master's command cruel? For here he commands to cut off the right hand and pluck out the right eye. I would say two words to these. First, it is no cruelty for a man to obey God's commands, be upon what cost it will. Am I cruel to obey him who has purchased a crown of glory to me? For we must cut off right-hand idols, lest we cannot, else we cannot enter into heaven. Second, are we cruel to ourselves when we are cruel to near and dear idols and lusts that would be our death if we be not theirs? When the business is brought to this pass, when we, will, when we will kill ere we be killed, the law of nature and the law of the nation bids you to kill right-hand idols that would kill you forever. Then I'll kill ere I be killed. Now, for use. What are you all doing? Are you cutting off all right-hand idols? Are you cutting off all parleying with them? Are you cutting off all provision from them? Well, I have this day, sirs, news to tell you. First, cutting off right-hand idols will never be a kindly work amongst you till you cut off with revenge and indignation. Therefore, if you fall, if you would fall about this work cheerfully, you should cut them off without pity. And secondly, I have these news to tell you that as long as ye have right-hand idols, the devil and you are still near hand one another. He has still the shortcut to get at you. He hath not much ado to prevail, for he hath still an agent within, a friend in the heart that will do the business. Therefore, quit your grips of the world, wife, children, goods, etc., and grip to God by a covenant, and that shall prove more profitable to you than all ye had or could enjoy in this present world. Another thing, and that by way of observation from these words, better enter into life maimed, says Christ. And the first observation is this, that Christians may be sent to heaven with a sensible loss as to all outward appearance. Wanting a hand, that is sensibly, a Christian may lose his worldly substance, and that is a right hand to him, and never get it made up on this side of time. But he may go to heaven with a sensible loss to all outward appearance. I go into life halt and maimed. I go into life wanting my goods. And the world knows that I am a sensible loser. Second observation, the Christian may that, delay, that lays down his fortune at Christ's feet must be well read both in the consideration of heaven and hell. And then he will not delay to lay down all he hath at Christ's feet feet. The last observation here is this, that heaven is the upmaking of all the losses that Christians meet with here. The men of the world say that they would not lose as much for religion as we have done, for they never saw so much worth in it. 
It is a strange thing, sirs, that you are offended at religion. I know well, pure religion never did you much hurt. The men of the world say, <clears throat> these are a number of poor, unnatural fools that will either neither take care of wife nor children. This is strange, sirs. For I know well some of us love our wives and children and love to provide for them as well as other folk love to provide for theirs if so be we could get it done with a good conscience. But when Christ's cause and covenant come in competition with these, we will take the better and leave the worse any time in all the year. But to speak a word or two to the life that believers will have in heaven that will make up all their losses There is an eightfold piece of life to be obtained by all the poor and despised followers of Christ. When a believer gets a a right impression of these upon his spirit, he will not stand to cut off right-hand idols for Christ. First, a life of peace with God. Peace with your own conscience. Peace with angels. And peace with all the saints. Oh, sweet life, a life of peace, peace forever, without interruption. Here I defy my former failings to molest my peace. Yea, justice itself to trouble my peace. Here is a life of peace, oh, sweet life. The second, another piece of life we will get in heaven, and that is a life of pleasure, pleasure forevermore. And what puts the copestone upon all our other joys in heaven it is pleasure at his right hand forevermore third but a piece of life to be had in heaven is a life of victory you will have a victorious life in heaven then you will be master and more of yourself then you will be master and more over your lusts and idols master over death and the grave master of the law and master of temptations Master of the outward man, master of enemies, and master of all things that mastered you before. Oh, the victorious life of heaven. All our songs will be songs of victory and triumph to the praise of the Lamb, always singing hallelujahs of victory. And fourth, as we will have a life of victory, so we will have an honorable life. Oh, the honor we will be advanced to with crowns on our heads and scepters in our hands, and clothed with robes of which we have heard only the fame, even the garments of salvation. Heard ye ever tell of the like of that garment? For the crown upon your head it shall be all set about with the fulfilling of the promises of the covenant of grace and the upmaking of all the articles of the marriage contract, like costly diamonds, Oh, honorable life, we shall live like kings and priests, all wearing crowns and scepters and being all kings and priests to God and to the Lamb forever. And fifth, as it is a life of honor, so it is a life of excellent enjoyment that we will get. Oh, the gallant enjoyment that we will have there, the enjoyment of Him whom we longed for, the enjoyment of Him whom we got but half looks and visits before the inter- before the eternal enjoyment of him whom we thought or were afraid we would never see who would not go half through hell for the enjoyment of these the enjoyment of himself fully so that all that is in god is for my good as if there were not another to partake of it but myself alone i shall enjoy him fully and wholly as if there were not another to enjoy him but I alone. All that he hath shall be mine. I shall enjoy him fully. I shall enjoy him immediately, face to face. I shall stand in no need of any advocate, mediator, or daysman betwixt us. And I shall enjoy him everlastingly. I shall forever feed upon him, and there shall be no end of it. Having this enjoyment and being in his arms once, it shall be my enjoyment to all eternity. Think ye not that I shall have a brave life of it? Oh, sirs, will ye not venture a right hand? 
or a right eye for that which shall pay for all? The enjoyment or life in heaven is a life of excellent discoveries that we never saw the like of before now. There is a fivefold discovery. The first, <clears throat> we will get a discovery of one God and three persons in the Godhead. One in three and three in one is able to comprehend. We could never take up that before fully. Oh, that is a great mystery. We shall have there the discovery of three in one and one in three. And second, we shall behold that great mystery of God and man both in one person and both concurring together for the advancement and glorification of the Christian. And third, we shall have a discovery of all the links of that union betwixt the Father and the Son, between the Son as the head and all particular believers as members in Him, and in the Father as the head of the Son, and the Son in the Father, and Christ in us, and we in Him. And so we in Christ and in the Father, and the Father in the Son, and the Son in the Father, and all believers in the Father and the Son, and the Father and the Son in all believers. Oh, great and glorious mystery. Fourth, we will get a discovery of all the articles of the covenant of redemption between the Father and the Son for the salvation of the sinner. We could never see that before so fully. We will see what the Father required of the Son and what the Son undertook to the Father for the redemption of lost man. And we will see the love in the bosom of the Father and the Son, both in one, two, and four, lost man. And both the Father and the Son making out their word in completing the work of the redemption of poor, lost man. And would ye have more? We shall see the great and eternal weight of glory that our cross hath been working out for us. And we never saw this so fully before, though we knew still that it was working out an eternal weight of glory for us. <clears throat> but we will never get a full discovery of that glory till we come there. Then we shall see it so as to wear and enjoy it forever. We had still a glance of it before, but then we shall possess it. Oh, sirs, is not this a pleasant life possessed of so many fair sights, excellent discoveries and noble enjoyments? Think he not but a poor man or woman will quit goods and all that has such a life to look to as this? Think ye not that we may venture a right-hand idol for it? And seven. There is a seventh piece of life that we will have there. It is a glorious and profitable life. We will always profit and need no ordinances, nor seek need to seek good sermons. We will need nothing. For we will have God for all. For we will be, as it were, in his very bosom. And there is no temple there. For we will have Christ in the place of sun, moon, meat, drink. We will live in the vision of the face of our Master Christ. We will feed wholly upon that. Oh, sirs, is not this a very glorious and profitable life that we shall have? For we shall still have a prophet with it. And it is a very glorious life. For we shall still have glory in perfection with us. Eighth, we shall have a life of abundance and all the parts of life, even all that I have mentioned. We shall have no scarcity, scant, nor want, as we used to say. Of these things there shall be abundance, abundance of peace and pleasure, abundance of victory, abundance of enjoyment, abundance of discoveries. Abundance of glory and profit and everything and no scarcity or scrimpness there. Well then, sirs, dwell much upon heaven and the life that is there and see if that will move you off 
right hand to Christ. But if that will not move you to it, then consider the torments of hell and see if that will move you to cut them off. Dwell much upon the consideration of hell where the worm dieth and not worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Will not the terrors of this move you to cut off right hand idols for Christ? Is it not better to be going about painful duties than to be pained in hell forevermore? Is it not better to serve Christ upon any terms than to serve the devil and get his wages after all? O oh, sirs, dwell much upon this consideration that ye may be persuaded to cut off right hand idols. Stand not with Christ upon these things, for he stands not with you about greater things. Study this and ye shall have a brave life of it. And may he that is able to persuade you to do it. Amen.